Hi, everybody. So we're going to start with talking a little bit about paint today. And we're going to talk specifically about painting a model, something like this. But in particular, I want to cover a bunch of basic techniques and uh, painting styles and basics of materials and supplies to start because it can be a little a bit overwhelming when you first go to the store and look at what you want to buy. So when you walk into a store, you might be confronted with something that looks like this. There are a bunch of different types or containers of paint, but all of these are acrylic. And there are different things that could distract you. We're going to use acrylic paint for most of the things that we're gonna do here. And one of the reasons we do that is because, especially in theater, when we're building models, this model is gonna be handed to a bunch of people. So if you're handing off these model pieces, you wanna make sure the binder is permanent. So what do I mean by that? The different varieties of paints that you can encounter in the store are called oil, acrylic, watercolor, gouache, and ink. And you can also encounter some others, but these are your big ones. Oil, you've probably heard of before, is not only something that takes days or weeks to mostly dry, it takes up, a, up to a year to fully dry. So oil paint's not gonna work well for our fast-paced industry. In addition to that, it has a lot of toxic elements to it that make it more difficult for you to work in enclosed spaces or traveling with that paint. So oil is not something we usually use to paint models. Watercolor and gouache are both possibilities, but one of their downsides is that they have a resoluble binder. So what does that mean? Every paint is composed of three parts, pigment, vehicle, and binder. Pigment is the dirt, the colored dirt inside of this paint that allows you to make it stick to a surface and force it to be that color. The vehicle is the thing that makes it liquidy and mobile. So this is dirt suspended in a liquid. It's just dirty water, but that dirty water has glue in it or binder, and that binder helps it to stick to a surface to keep that surface that color. As you get more complicated in other varieties of paint, you can get things with different amounts of other fillers inside that either is something like chalk, which will make it harder to see through and make it more opaque and less transparent. Or it can be something that will make it smoother as it paints or thicker when it paints. There are different uh, ratios of pigment to binder to vehicle that make the paints act differently. As well as there are different additives they can also add to it because some of these pigments can be very expensive, especially bright red pigments magenta pigments, purple pigments, and a lot of blue pigments. But watercolor has a binder that's resoluble, which means when you add water to it, that glue reactivates and gets sticky again. And then when it dries, it resets. So acrylic, once it dries, is plastic. It doesn't move. And the advantage to that means that one, it does dry really quickly, much quicker than oil, and the acrylic itself dries to a place where you're able to handle that piece and it won't rub off. Watercolor or gouache will. That being said, they make great mediums for renderings or painter's elevations, things that aren't being touched by hands a whole lot. Uh, the oil in your finger and the humidity on your hands can definitely react, reactivate both watercolor or gouache and cause them to smudge. Uh, the difference between watercolor and gouache is that gouache has a little bit more chalk or filler in it. So it tends to be a bit more opaque. So you can paint with it like watercolor or make mix it a little thicker and paint with it very op opaquely the way we often paint with oil or acrylic. Um, or we think of painting with oil or acrylic. So neither of these are the ones we're going to want to use for a model. Ink, although it is comes in a bottle that usually looks like this and it's usually very pigmented but it's also very permanent and kind of unforgiving and it's a little bit more and it's very transparent it doesn't really have an opaque version so painting on top of itself can be a little difficult so we don't like to use ink for models either so acrylic is our paint of choice 
So when you're looking at all of the different items, all of these are acrylic, how do you know which one to choose? Well, anything you choose is gonna be, uh, you're gonna get what you pay for, is honestly what's gonna happen. But sometimes you don't need the finest archival, amazing piece of paint. That's not always the requirement you need. So these two, as you can tell from there, metal surrounding and stronger tube are more expensive or thicker paints and they're more expensive. These ones are a little bit more medium body and medium expensive. And then this one right here is super cheap. And you can usually get these for uh, under a dollar at Walmart or something like that. And the difference is it has much less pigment in it. It's gonna be very transparent and very watery and it's not gonna have a lot of body to it. But if that is fine for you, then that's fine for you. So one of the things you might wanna consider is getting a couple of colors in the, this paint and then a slightly more expensive white so that you can mix in something to give it a little bit more body. That being said, this is the kind that I usually use for model painting and rendering and anything that I need to do for scenic design because I'm not looking at these pieces being our artwork, our art on stage is the artwork. So this is about communication and these colors can give me a bigger advantage in having a cheap but effective paint to use. That being said, it really will mean that I have a slightly harder time working with those colors than if I bought a more expensive color or more expensive brush. As you can see, I've bought a metallic in this super cheap paint because I don't use metallic very often. So for something a little bit more um, decorative, it, it, it will work for me just fine. So I actually have gold and silver and some of those in this much cheaper metallic version. And I have several of these colors in Liquitex acrylic and these ones I find are a really good balance of affordability and for a pretty good product and these ones over here I have them but as you can see from this rose I don't use it very often because I just feel um, apprehensive about using a very expensive paint on a kind of throwaway project All right. So we're going to move on to looking at how do you select what color you want. So once you go and pick what you're going to paint with and you're like, okay, I'm going to do acrylic and I'm going to buy this tiny tube because that's all I need just for a little project. And you think you've got a good choice. You have another choice to face because it's not just this in the store, a little more like this. So this is a lot of colors and a lot of choices to make. And one of the things you want to remember is that although all of these intricate colors in between red, yellow, blue, and your basic tones are really sometimes nice to have if you're in a pinch, but they also tend to limit you as a beginning artist. You're going to be tempted to use this pink and only this pink, or maybe this purple or this purple, and not really mix a color in between. This can be nice when you want to repeat the same color over and over, but it can also be very limiting in that there are many more greens in the possibility of color mixing than just these. And there are many more oranges that just than what just lies in here. But if you're not mixing that color and you're using your tubes, it can be difficult to hit that color you want and it can limit your creativity when you're thinking of something. You might not be able to think of a teal that's not based in one of these two colors. And if you don't have all these colors, it can be hard to think of more colors as well. By having to mix, it also gets you very well acquainted with the colors you do have. So you can buy bigger colors of colors that you like. It also, the more you mix with the same color over and over, the more you really understand how that color mixes with other colors and you understand which ones have much more strong pigments and push other colors around, and which ones are very soft, sedate, and mute, mute, muted. So when we're looking at this color combination, one of the things I wanna pay attention to is that colors often have a cool version and a red version, or a, a, a cool version and a warm version. And I think of that a little bit by thinking about what's a little bit closer 
to one side or the other of the color wheel. So what do I mean by that? I mean if you take a basic yellow, red, and blue, what I want to look at is, is this blue a little closer to red or a little closer to purple? And you can kind of see it better when you compare it to something else. So one of these I think looks a lot more purple, a little more red, and the other one looks a little cooler, a little closer to green. Now it doesn't look green, I'm very aware of that, but it is cooler in tone than this one is. This one feels a little bit closer to purple than it does to green, and this one feels a little bit closer to green than it does to purple. So these are the two blues I like to default to. They give me a really good range. If I need to mix a really bright, vibrant green, this one will give me a very bright, vibrant green. And if I wanna mix something that's a little bit more army green, this one will give me a lot mute, more muted of a tone because even though it's still blue and mixes with yellow to make green, it won't make as vibrant of a green as this one. So I always look for my primary colors in a warm and cool variety. So ultramarine blue and phalo blue are uh, my, my go-to blues, if you will. So I would purchase those. And the rest of these, this pale blue, lake blue, sky blue, are one of these blues combined with white. So I really don't need to worry about purchasing these. So I am going to set this back in its bag. Now, cobalt blue is usually a great blue. In this particular uh, tube, I don't, I don't love it in this particular brand, and I feel like it's very uh, diluted with white in particular. So I don't love using this blue in this set. And I already have a ultramarine and a phalo blue. So I'm gonna go ahead and not pick that one up. So that also leads me to greens. Now there are, I generally, uh, or actually let's come back to greens. We were on primary colors. So reds are here. Let's put our purple and our pinks aside. And there's this orange and a flesh color. Well, those are, those are a little silly. So I'm just gonna take those and put those away. We're not gonna need those. So I'm gonna look at, do I want medium yellow, lemon yellow, or deep yellow? And this one is the one that strikes me as much, much cooler than the others. So I would put them in this order. This is a, a very kind of greenish yellow or a bright yellow. And this one is a little bit warmer, and this is even warmer. It gets closer to orange. You could almost say that that's an orange. So if I want my biggest variety, I can choose these ones. But also, if I don't love that lemon yellow, I could choose these two. And it just means that my cool yellow isn't as cool as it could be. But still, in comparison to this one, it will be cool. So I am gonna go ahead and choose, I don't think the difference between these two is big enough, so I'm gonna go ahead and choose these two. And I'm gonna set those aside and keep those, and this one I'm gonna put away. So my red, when I look at them together, you can really see that this is almost a, um, a lipstick red, like it's a deeper, a deeper red, a darker red. And this one is a bright red and this one is a bright red. This one is a little bit more orange. This one is a little bit more orange than this one is. And that is kind of what I'm looking for. So I really like this one as my warmer red because it's a little bit closer to orange than the other two. And I am tempted to make this combination right here because I like how bright this permanent red is. And this crimson, even though it's a, a uh, definitely a cooler red, it feels a little dark to me. It feels a little diluted with black, and I don't particularly like that for mixing. So I, you, I start with these six, a warm and a cool, of our three primaries, and I always get white. And that should be it. That's all you really need. This will get you everywhere you need to be. 
And I want to note that I didn't choose black. You don't have to get black, but black is a good shortcut, especially with model building, but you want to be very careful and sparing with it. And it's almost better to get a really dark brown than it is to get a black, but we can also mix a black from other colors. So let's say we also get our black and we're ready to go. And you are ready to go. This is all you really need. So that begs the question, if you do a lot of painting, what other colors might you want to purchase just because? Well, there are metallics, as I said before, are ones I use sparingly and not and it, they just, I don't have a need for them very often. So you can buy those if you need them, but generally that is when you're going to buy them, is when you have a project that calls for them rather than buying one off the bat. Uh, so these ones here, I have a neutral gray, a warm gray, and a milky white. And it, there's something really nice about this milky white that it's not quite white, it's a little bit tan. If you look at it, right next to the white, you might be able to see the difference. You might not on the camera, but this one's just a little bit creamier than this white. So what happens is that you get highlights that are a little bit skewed toward warm. And this is really effective, but you can also just add a little bit of color into your white paint. So I tend to use bright, real white. And then if I need a, a light highlight color, I'll mix that in. If I'm doing any personal artwork, I might use the Milky White. These two grays, the same way, are really uh, light versions and basic shortcut mixes so that you don't have to do something. So unless I'm doing a project that I'm going to be painting a lot of things gray and I know I'm painting a lot of things gray, I'm not going to use the gray paint. I'm going to mix my own gray paint. So there are a couple exceptions to the rules of, oh, you shouldn't buy any other colors than your primaries. And one is brown. I use brown a lot. Um, we use brown in uh, wood grains. We use brown in all sorts of things. And I don't want something that's a little too yellow, and I don't want something that's a little too dark. So I want something that's a nice medium brown that I can use over the top of wood grains and things like that. And to be completely honest, I, I do love both Burnt Umber and Burnt Sienna, and I'd be tempted to buy them both. You can choose whichever one you like the most, but I like the Burnt Umber, and that's what I'm going to go with. I don't think you have any need to buy these aquas. You can mix them. But the other two that you might want to consider pur purchasing is a green and a purple. So purple, or magenta, is a very unusual pigment, and it can be difficult to get this out of your full colors. If you've ever tried to mix purple and you just end up with blech, then you'll know that it can be difficult to mix those colors. But it just, usually that happens because you're not mixing the right tone blue with the right tone red. You need a cool red and a cool blue to make a nice purple. The same way that you need, or I'm sorry, a warm red and a warm blue to make a nice purple, the same way that you need a cool blue and a cool yellow to make a nice green. So especially if you want something vibrant. But with the, the greens here, you can see that I have a range, like this green right here is very, very bluish, and this one is very, very yellowish. So the, yellowish. So this one's very warm and this one's very cool. And this is in fact phalo green, it's so cool, it has the same name as phalo blue. And you can see how related they are. So I do personally love me some phalo green. And I love, but it it's so close to the phalo blue I already have that it doesn't make a very effective green. And neither does this olive green. I usually go for something like chrome oxide light green or grass green. This bright green is not super pigmented. So I usually am depending on the project or just depending on what, what I'm going for. And this is something I would buy for a project. I'd usually mix my green. In this example, I'm not going to mix, use this to mix, um, use this to mix a green, but I'm going to use it for wood grain and things like that. And for that, in my experience, chrome oxide green is the most useful. 
Now, that being said, I do like this grass grain a lot. So I think I'll go ahead and make it more difficult for me and grab that grass grain. And then these pinks and purples, only if you need a purple, I think this is worth uh, purchasing. But I always purchase the most purple, like deep, true purple color that I can find. These pinks, I also, if you need a pink for a project, you are probably gonna have to buy a pink because it is something that is hard to mix out of your other colors. So I would actually buy a pink if I need a pink before I buy a purple, even though I definitely like purple better. I'm not gonna need either of these for this project, so I'm gonna set that aside. Uh, so once you know, so I think that these make an excellent group of colors for you to pick. And to be clear, these are the ones that you need and these are the ones that you can purchase just to help shortcut some of your mixing. Uh, a brown because you'll have to mix brown a lot and a green because it'll really add into these colors and help push them down when you need to and also if you need to mix a green. And black just to shortcut some of your mixing. So now let's talk about some of the other tools that you'll be using. So once you have the paint that you want to use. There are a couple other tools that you can use to apply that paint. So one, of course, being brushes. And brushes can get very complicated. But especially for model painting, you want some small brushes, but you don't just want small brushes. And small brushes, I find the most useful ones are round brushes, and you want a slightly nicer brush that gets to a nice, uh, nice point so that you can use them both thicker and thinner, depending on the pressure you put down. But you also don't want to disregard your square brushes or flat brushes. And this one here is called a filbert, where it has a slightly tapered edge. These all give you a different amount of control, but you want some big brushes to lay in big color. You also want a fan brush to be able to get some texture. This will allow you to open up the bristles and get a dry brush texture like you would in scenic painting. A toothbrush. Don't use this for brushing your teeth after you've used it for paint, but you can water down your paint and then use your thumb across the edge to get a nice fine flick of dots, just like spatter. The other thing is if you want to draw a straight line, you can absolutely use a tiny round brush, but what I find often comes in handy is using a dip pen, and I can water down the acrylic and put it into this pen with a brush, very similar to how I would use it to draw or write little details, I can get really precise highlights and very thin lines. Don't forget, just like anything else, if you want to draw a straight line, use a ruler. Uh, I know it seems weird, but if you want to draw a straight line, use a ruler. This will often mean that you are waiting for paint to dry so that you can very cleanly get a straight line. But it is worth it if that's the a really straight line is what you need. The other thing is you need to be able to control, once you have paint and you have a brush, you need to be able to control how that paint gets into your brush. And one of the ways is water, a palette, and a paper towel. So this is not a palette you're probably used to seeing. You're probably used to seeing something like this, and that's absolutely fine. And I will use this for most of our demonstration. But this right here is what is called a wet palette. And what this is, is a piece of sponge, like cloth in the bottom, and you can use an actual sponge, and then a piece of pa parchment paper on top, and this is just a an airtight container, or a Tupperware container, that I often use for, um, that I no longer use for food, but was originally a food container. And it has this little rubber gasket to keep it nice and airtight, which is lovely. And what happens is I put, you can see that I put the orange piece of paper, orange sponge at the bottom and then I put the parchment paper on top and then I put water across that sponge and I have a little dropper bottle with uh, water and I can push it into this corner and it will absorb into that sponge and travel across the bottom. I can also put some around the edge over here. And what this does is it allows some moisture to slowly come up through the parchment paper and when you press on it, you get more moisture. And as moisture starts to evaporate, the moisture is coming out through the paper. 
So this slowly allows the moisture to stay in the acrylic paint without the acrylic paint drying up completely. And it helps to keep your paint a little bit wet for a little bit longer. So if you're doing really fine details on something and you have to keep remixing your color, that can be a pain. But by putting it in here, you can get it to stay wet longer.